We're going to speak today on 15 reasons. The King James Bible is God's perfect Word. 15 reasons. If you look there in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7, it says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Aren't you glad you have a Word of God? Dear Father, bless the preaching of Thy holy, preserved, infallible, sufficient Word. We do pray, God, that we would use it, honor it, and fight with it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, we've seen that you need to know the commandments of God. You need to know what God commands so you'll be able to quote these commandments in the face of temptation. When the devil comes to tempt you, it's very important that you know what it is God requires of you. Our Bible is sharper than any two-edged sword. The Bible says it's a hammer that can smash the strongholds in pieces. And whatever strongholds are in your life, the Word of God can get down and root it up. And we've got to get down to those foundational sins. A lot of times these sins in your life have some foundation. Maybe some pride. Maybe some self-pity. And you need to take the Word of God and not just try to deal with the external sin, but get down to the bottom, the root of these things. And God has commandments against pride, doesn't He? God has commandments. He has wonderful teachings, powerful teachings to help you understand. And what's important to see today is that we're instructed to take the Word of God and stand with it against the devil. And I want you to know that the whole point of this section in the Word of God is that you will have on your spiritual armor and be ready for an attack. Opportunities may come up. Things are going to happen, a lot of them orchestrated by the devil. And if you are not ready with your armor on, you're going to make the wrong decisions. The devil's going to set you up. You're going to have choices that you make that seem reasonable, and you're not even going to be aware that the devil is acting upon you. Say, so, well, what do I do? Well, you do what Jesus told Peter to do. Watch and pray. Get your armor on. And get ready for these attacks. Y'all listening today? I'm tired of seeing people unprepared to meet the devil, aren't you? I'm tired of preaching week after week after week how to get your spiritual armor on so you'll be able to fight. And then the devil shows up, gives you a temptation, and then off they go. I'm sick of it. It's time for Christians to wake up. It's time for Christians to get their armor on and listen to the Word of God so they can be prepared to fight the devil. But that's not my sermon today. That's just something I wanted to say at the beginning, all right? Before we leave this verse in verse 17 here, I want to remind you that we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. We see how the devil works in Genesis 3. I'll quote it for you. The devil cast doubt on the Word of God. See, the Bible says you know about the devil not by reading Anton LaVey and Elisha Crowley. You know about the devil from reading the Word of God. And you know what his devices are. They're exposed right there in the Word of God. And listen to how the devil approached Eve. The devil, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He's subtle, is he not? And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said? 
You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So when the devil shows up, he's going to take the commandments of God and he's going to unravel them. He's not going to directly oppose them at first. What he's going to do is take the commandments of God and suggest that maybe that's not what God taught. Perhaps. Maybe we're wrong about that. And the problem is, is when God has spoken plainly and you're still questioning it, that's a problem. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. My Lord is not a legalist. In other words, uh, his commandments are not grievous, says Eve. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And of course, the devil then begins to work on it. You shall not surely die. Oh, he loves to insinuate these doubts, doesn't he? And this is what the devil does. And so the devil implies that you know God's holding back on you. God's not a good God. He's not a loving God. What God has done is He's giving you these horrible commandments. Of course, you just got one. But nevertheless, it's a horrible commandment. And, uh, you know, you need to just escape that uh, horrible oppression that's in your house. And you need to get out from under it and be a God, you know. And I'm going to show you the way to do that so you can have that liberty. And the devil's offering it today to millions of people. And they're taking it. And I tell you what, it's the same thing over again, isn't it? You don't find liberty. You find hardship and destruction and death. And that's what Eve found. She found death. And I'm going to tell you, God's motives can be trusted, but the devil's motives cannot be trusted. You know, today we have a Bible version market. Are you aware of that? Are you aware that the love of money is the root of all evil? And when you walk into a Christian bookstore, they want to sell you the new updated version. And there's the rap version and the white version and the Hispanic version. And there's everything. There's the pop version. There's the legalist version, the non-legalist version. And there's everything. And you know what it does in the end? We've been preaching on the street 20 years. You know what it does in the end? I deal with people every week. You know what it does to people? It makes them say, who cares anymore? Saturation. We've been drenched with all these new versions. Who knows what the Word of God is anymore? This one says one thing, this says another, and now you're, there's another 20 that's come out. The past couple of years, who cares anymore? That's what the world is saying. How can we ever know? It's not that we don't believe in the Bible, but who can know what God's saying? Who's behind that, folks? The devil. First Corinthians 14 says, If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? We've got an uncertain sound today, don't we? Do you know I've shown... In many sermons and books, my latest book on the King James Bible, The Word, Will God Keep It? I've shown, I've documented that all of occultism, all of Satanism, and these new Bible versions attack man's reason. The devil does not want you to be sure of anything. That's what humanistic education is about. There is no truth. Everything is relative. Uh, it doesn't matter. You have your opinion. He has his opinion. There is no absolute truth. And that humanism has entered into the new Bibles. And when you look in these new versions, everywhere the King James Bible says certainty, it's deleted. Everywhere the King James Bible says sure, it's deleted. Everywhere the King James Bible says study, it's deleted. Everywhere the King James Bible says reason, it's deleted in the new version. Everywhere the King James Bible says infallible, it has been deleted. Change. You have a Bible. People say, well, there's nothing wrong with this. It just got rid of the these and thou. Well, you need the these and thou. They show you whether you're talking to one person or a group of people. You need the these and thou. But not only that, people do not realize how subtle the devil is. Their readers say, oh, I don't see anything wrong with that. Well, you've got to look a little bit closer, people. You need to understand. I've documented in my, in my book the history of how evil men and seducers have set out to destroy the King James Bible. I have documented worshipers of Lucifer that have said we're going to use the public school system to get rid of the King James Bible through propaganda. 
I have shown you how Manly P. Hall, the great worshiper of Lucifer, the great occultist, has said the greatest books in the world are the manuscripts behind the new versions. And he said we must use these to overthrow the King James Bible. I've shown how Masons, men of secret societies, occultists, have set out, Unitarians, liberals, infidels, higher critics, have set out to destroy the King James Bible. And men began to cry against it and said, if you touch that foundation that millions of people believe is the infallible Word of God, if you touch it, it will bring a moral decay like you've never seen. It will overthrow the fabric of society. And you know, they were right. They were right. I tell you what, they touched that King James Bible and it brought the sexual revolution. It brought all of that mess upon America. We're still suffering from it today and we haven't hit bottom yet. But we, we're getting closer, aren't we? And when we hit, it's going to be a big bang. You know, they worship the big bang. I tell you what, I'm about to show you a big bang. We're about to fall into bestiality and cannibalism and riot and chaos in society like you've never seen before. All because they mess with our book. And you'll never fix anything in America today till you get that book back. And if you can't fix the nation, you can fix your churches, can't you? You can fix your families, can't you? I tell you what, you better get the book back. You better get the Bible back. You better get your sword back. If I had time, I'd like to call a girl up here and give her a, a sword and send Luke up here with a paper sword. And then I'd like to just cut his sword all up so it's just a bunch of pieces and let him try to fight. That's what we're dealing with today. We're trying to fight and somebody's going to cut your Bible all up. It's in pieces all over the place. I praise God I got a Bible. Amen. Amen. I'm glad I have one. If you don't know where the Word of God is today, how can you resist Satan when he tries to tempt you? This is the problem. How can you quote the Word of God if you don't know what it is? You can't play around about this issue. When Eve lost the Word of God, half God said, she began to question it. Maybe he didn't say that. Maybe I'm wrong about what he said. When the devil suggested that doubt about the Word of God, she was now set up to lose her fear. And that's what happened to America. That's what happened to the world. Once they started doubting the Word of God, they started doubting the fear of God. And then there was no more fear in the land. And she was enticed into sin. You know, if the foundations be destroyed, says the Bible, what can the righteous do? If your Bible's taken away, you no longer believe it anymore. What can the righteous do? There's little fear out on the street today. Hath God said, you quote something to these people and what do they say? Well, what's it say in the original languages? Who taught them that? They have no authority, no foundation, no certainty. They say the Bible's been written by man. As if God's not big enough to control man's hand. I'm going to give you some reasons right now why the King James Bible is God's perfect word today in English. The documentation for all of these things, I'm going to move quickly through it. The documentation for it all is in my recent book, The Word God Will Keep It. The purpose of this sermon is to summarize and press upon your mind these general points. And really a whole sermon could be preached on each one of these points I'm going to give you. The King James Bible is God's infallible word because, number one, it's hated by God's enemies by heretics and deceivers. There is no other book on the face of this earth, no other book on the face of the earth that's hated as much as that King James Bible. And when you look at the people that hate it, that shows me what the truth is. 
So I'm starting with a negative right here. I'm going to show you, I know the King James Bible is the Word of God by those that hate it. Isn't that something? When homosexuals, witches, New Agers, Luciferians, occultists, Masons, Catholics, I mean, I could just go, and I got them all listed in my book. When every one of these people hates one book, not the original Greek manuscript, when they hate that King James Bible, something's going on, folks. They don't hate the NIV like that. What's going on here? Manly P. Hall said the books behind the NIV, you know, Sinaiticus and these others, are the greatest manuscripts in the world. Why don't they hate the new version? You know why? Because they're theosophic, Gnostic versions. That's why. They're not rooted in the Word of God. You know, Jim Jones, I quoted the other day, when he stood up, they used the King James Bible for toilet paper, and Jim Jones spat on it, stepped all over the King James Bible, and he said, I defy the God of King James. He called him a sky god. And he said, the King James Bible has errors. What book did he despise, folks? Amen. What book did he despise? The King James Bible. Every satanic person hates that King James Bible. You know, it says in Proverbs 29, an unjust man is an abomination to the just, and he that is upright in the way is abomination to the wicked. And if we got an upright Bible right here, it's going to be an abomination to the wicked, isn't it? That's right. We got an upright Bible. Is it a just Bible? Yes. Oh, I tell you it is. Let me tell you number two. King James Bible is God's word is God's word because the proud scribes despise it. The proud scribes despise it. Just look at all the men with a whole bunch of letters beside their name and watch how liberal they become. Watch how they get off, leave the cardinal doctrines of the Word of God, the fundamental truths, and, and watch how they, they walk in all of their pride and all of their so-called scholarship, and watch what they begin to attack. They resent, they're jealous of the authority of the Word of God because they want the common people to follow them and not follow that book. They do not want you to have a book by which you can test them and say, no, sir, here's what the book says. They want you to follow their opinion and they don't want to submit to the book and have to prove to you from the book what they're teaching. A godly pastor will try to prove to you from the book what he's preaching. He will see it as his responsibility to show you from the book what is true. But these scribes, you know, Jesus is called the what in the Bible? The Word. So He gives you a type, doesn't He? Who despised Jesus? Was it the common people? Who despised Jesus? The scribes and the scholars. John chapter 7, then answered the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on Him? Do any scribes or any of the scribes, King James only? And they laugh and they mock it and they... But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. What do you say about millions of people that believe that's the infallible Word of God? They say, well, they're just ignorant. They're uneducated. And that's when you go to seminary. That's what they tell you. The people out there are ignorant. But I tell you what, you're smart because we're going to give you the keys of knowledge. Nicodemus saith unto him, he that came to Jesus by night, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. So then that's when they start. They were wrong about Jesus coming from Galilee. He only lived in Galilee. He wasn't born in Galilee. So, see, they had this wrong teaching, but they used that. Oh, well, the King James Bible has the word Easter in it, so it must be wrong. Oh, King James, King James was a homosexual, you know. And, and they use all those lies and they throw that stuff out. And people believe it without checking to see the truth. Mark chapter 12. He said unto them in his doctrine, this is what Jesus said, Beware of the common people. Is that what he said? No. Beware of the what? Jesus said, Beware of the scribes. 
which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces. Well, they got some long letters after their names, don't they? They love... and They're in the marketplace, by the way. Oh, I tell you. Beware of the scribes. So, I know the King James Bible is the Word of God because the scribes hate it. I know the King James Bible is the Word of God by who its enemies are. But let me go further. Number three. I know the King James Bible is the Word of God because the common people in the best ages have loved it and believed it to be inspired. See, this is something they're not telling you in this generation, but I just published a book that documented centuries and centuries of people that not... They didn't say it was just a good version. We're talking thousands, millions of people that said this is the infallible, inspired Word of God and God did a miracle and gave to us the Bible in the English language. They don't want you to know that information, see. They want you to think that the King James Only movement is just this new thing, you know. But I show that that is wrong. And when you look at all these people, they know. And I'm talking about the people in the wisest ages. They knew which book was the Word of God. And no matter what the scribes said, they said, I'm going to stick to that book. I'm going to stick to this book. You know, it says in Mark 12, the common people heard Him gladly. The common people heard Jesus gladly. And the common people understand the King James Bible is the Word of God unless the scribes deceive them. Unless the scribes deceive them, they know that that book is the Word of God. Let me give you number four. I know the King James Bible is the Word of God because no other book today is believed to be inspired and infallible in this manner. Do you understand the debate today is not between whether the King James Bible is inspired or whether the NIV is inspired? I don't know a single person on earth. Maybe you'll find one somewhere, but I have not been able to find a single person on earth that believes the NIV is inspired. Not a single person or the NAS, or the Living Bible, or the New King James Bible, or any Greek manuscript. Do you understand these people, the New Version advocates, that say only the originals are inspired? Look at the doctrinal statements of some of these organizations and some of these churches and some of these uh, movements. Look at their doctrinal statement and, and read it very carefully. The number, the number one thing in their doctrinal statement will say, we believe the Bible is infallible. And inspired and perfect in the original manuscripts long ago that aren't here anymore, for they're all gone and went bye-bye. That's what they say. They don't believe there is a perfect Bible on earth anywhere. Say, well, I read a book by so-and-so, Mr. White or D.A. Carson, all these people, and I've read books and, and, and they, they act like they believe the Bible. Read plainly what they say. They say there is no Bible on earth. There is no Bible on earth. None of these people that oppose the King James Bible today have anything to substitute for it. You say, well, what do they substitute for it? Uh, the word of a scribe. He looks over here and he says, I like the way this is translated. Then he looks over here and he says, well, that's a good translation to prove my point over here. And uh, I, I like what this Greek dictionary says. And I like this definition. And they pick and choose all over the faith. Not a one of them will agree uh, perfectly. Do you understand? They all are making it up as they go along. None of them believe. Show me a book that people believe is perfect, infallible, inspired on the face of the earth like people believe that King James Bible is inspired. Even today, after years and years of attack and assault, another one comes up upon the scene. I mean, you could go to churches across America today. You wouldn't find a revised version if you tried. But that was the first one that tried to overthrow the King James Bible. And then the American Standard Version. And then after that, you had the new revised version, you know, the revised standard version. And then after that, it was the NAS. Then you got the NIV. Then you got the new edition of the NIV. They have to keep giving you new editions and new editions, and they're, and they're owned by satanic companies anyway. The same company that, pres that prints the satanic Bible publishes the NIV. What a world we live in today.
What a world we live in today. No other book today is believed to be inspired and infallible. You know, if you're looking around, there's everybody saying, this is. That's what they did with Jesus. People believed he was not only a good person. There were some that believed he was a good person. But you had people that believed he was the Messiah. Wow. When you've got a book and you've got a movement that's been going on for 400 years, of people saying that book is the infallible inspired Word of God. You better look at it. You better just put aside what you've been taught in seminary because you've been brainwashed to get out here and sell Bibles for a Bible company. Who do you think donates money to these seminaries? It's a market, folks. They control preachers just like they control doctors. Doctors are designed to sell you drugs and make pharmaceutical companies rich. Preachers are designed to be taught to sell Bibles for Christian bookstores and big publishing companies. Number four, number five. I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God because of the fruit and power it has and brings forth. Amen. Oh, I tell you what. We need to bring forth fruit, do we not? And that book brings forth fruit. No other. When we were believing that book, people called that the good old days. You didn't have to lock your door. I'm not saying things were perfect, but you know what? Wherever that book was at, it began to purify society. It began to purify people. Wherever that book went, it began to purify people. Have you seen the power of that book in your own life? No other book has power like that. No other book has brought forth the great missionary revival movements. No other book has brought about the great prophetic movements throughout history. The great moral movements. I tell you what, it's all rooted in one book. They didn't get up and say, the original Greek says. They were just quoting the book. Say, what about Spurgeon and Moody? I show in my book, if Spurgeon hadn't smoked a pipe and died early, he was opening, he was basically opening his eyes to the whole deception of everything that was going on. And he began to write his, uh, he called it the downgrade controversy. And he was exposing the scribes and exposing them to the scribes. And he was finally to the point of just rebuking them and telling them, you know, you stick with that King James Bible and forget what these scribes are telling you. And, and he was getting wiser and wiser and so was Moody. And then he died. Get rid of that tobacco, folks. I'm telling you, God wants you to live. And there, you don't want to cut your life short. But Moody, he began to suspect that something was wrong about the scribes. And he began to say, you know, if that Bible, that King James Bible, told me that Jonah swallowed the well, I'd believe it. Amen. <laughs> I believe that the Bible teaches. They said, you really, Moody, you really believe that... A well swallowed Jonah, and he said, I tell you what, if that King James Bible said that Jonah swallowed the well, I would believe it. He was waking up, amen? He was waking up to the scribes. The Bible says in Luke 8, that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, cover it with a vessel or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick. I tell you what, God gave us the Bible so it can bring forth fruit. Amen. Wherever the Bible is, wherever the candle of the Lord is, it's going to bring forth fruit. And it's sad sometimes when people are obeying the King James Bible. And they have this flicker. And some of them even begin to shine brightly. And then all of a sudden they just burn out. They get choked by the cares of this world, the pleasures. Or they get offended. Jesus says, blessed are they that are not offended in me. You ever seen a Christian shine brightly? Oh, they're shining. They're soul winning. They're bringing forth fruit. They're rejoicing. They're loving the fellowship. Everything's good. And all of a sudden that light just begins to flicker and it goes out. Don't you let your light go out. Amen? You stick in that King James Bible. You stick in that King James Bible. Don't you let yourself get offended in the Word of God. 
The Bible says in Isaiah 55, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. I know where God's Word is because it prospers. I know where God's Word is because it doesn't return void. It says in Daniel 8 that they cast the truth to the ground, down to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. When people believed the King James Bible, they prospered spiritually, even economically. I mean, everything was blessed because that book is the root of blessing. It is the fountain of blessing. But when they said, well, let's get out from under this book. Let's take it out of our schools. Let's take it out of our home. Let's take it out of our churches. Have we been prospering? The downgrade. You better believe it. You know, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the Word of God is not bound. The Word of God's not bound. You know what that tells me? Since the Word of God's not bound, whatever man tries to do to it, it's just going to bounce right back up. Man tries to cut it. Man tries to suppress it. Man tries to use public education to suppress the Word of God. Man tries to raise up scribes and call them doctors and put them at the head of churches and try to teach people that the Word of God is not to be followed anymore. And I'm telling you, is the Word of God bound? No. They still have not been able to stop it. And the King James Bible movement is alive and well. It's alive and well. Century after century, they said after all of our propaganda, after all of our Hollywood evolution, public school indoctrination, you still have a King James Bible movement that they can't stop. Woo, it's not bound, is it? Hey, let me tell you something. Number six, King James Bible is the Word of God because of its supernatural consistency. There is no other book where you can begin to compare Scripture with Scripture, word to word, and end up with a consistency that defies anything man could ever put together. I tell you, from Genesis to Revelation, it says the sun, S-U-N, is a he. And from Genesis to Revelation, every time you see the moon, they don't miss it one time, it's a she. And you have the sun as the he, and you have the moon as the she, and you have that beautiful picture that that presents. All throughout the Bible, you have man's soul, the realm of his feelings, as the she. But you have man's spirit, his intellect, as a he, showing you which one is to be in control and which one is to be a compliment and a blessing. Aren't you glad you have feelings? Amen. But I tell you what, you're to have your mind in control of your feelings, are you not? You're to have a proper order here. That King James Bible, that's just one thing. Every time I preach a study, every time I preach a Bible study, I end up showing somewhere why the King James Bible is so consistent, so perfect. It works. It teaches. It's connected in ways that no other book on the face of the earth could ever be connected. You say, well, don't other religions believe in perfect books? Every time I speak with people of other religions, they tell me, you just have to have blind faith. You're trying to think it out. You're trying to think. And we don't come at it by evidence and by thinking. You just have to believe and feel. What's Hinduism? Is Hinduism about your rational mind? Hinduism is about closing your eyes. Hinduism is about closing your eyes and just feeling things. If we had time, I would love to show you more about how the King James Bible is supernaturally consistent in an amazing way. Number seven, I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God because the truth, the doctrine, the certainty that it teaches. Do you know that there's only one book that teaches you how to study the Bible and that's the King James Bible? No other version teaches it. Do you know that the King James Bible teaches the Trinity? 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh, but the other Bibles take that out. 1 John 5.7, the Trinity, uh, that's the powerhouse verse of the Trinity. New versions take it out. Do you know the King James Bible preserves salvation through the blood? Salvation by the blood, but new versions take that out in places. Do you know salvation by grace through faith alone is consistently taught in the King James Bible, but new versions teach salvation through obedience? 
Do you know reasoning is taught in the King James Bible? Reasoning with God, but all the other new versions take it out so you're no longer thinking and reasoning. I know the King James Bible is the Word of God because it's holy. It's holy. The doctrines that it preserves are holy. Number eight. I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God because God said He would preserve His Word. But all the other folks are telling me God didn't preserve His Word. The people behind the Living Bible and the NIV and all of these other things, they say God did not preserve His Word. But God said, Matthew 24, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but My words, with an S on it, shall not what? Pass away. God's Bible will not pass away. You say, well, if man messes it all up, and, and the Greek language is dead. It's a dead language and people don't speak it anymore in the same way, uh, ancient Greek. Then the Bible's gone. Is that true? You know, in Jeremiah 36, that king took his pen knife and tore up the Bible and cast it into the fire. And you know what God did? He just gave it again to Jeremiah. He revived it right out of that fire. When Moses broke the Ten Commandments, you know what happened? God just gave it back again. Can man get rid of the Word of God on earth? No, sir. No. You say, English is dead. Uh, the, the, the dead, ancient Greek language is dead. God will just revive it in the international language of end times. God said He would preserve it. Amen? Yes, He did. Cannot lie. Number nine. I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God because the Bible says that in the last days, people will die for the Word of God. It says in Revelation chapter 20, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. Judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the Word of God. Why were they beheaded? Why did they get their heads cut off? What was it for? For the Word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither His image, neither had received His mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Folks, that's still future. The Antichrist, the mark of the beast, the tribulation period, it's coming. This is future. And John prophesied by the Holy Ghost, he saw that there's going to be Millions of people, a lot of people at least, that are going to die, martyrdom, for the Word of God. To me, that sounds like people know where the Bible is. They're not dying for originals that used to be here that nobody's ever seen on earth. They're not dying for an NIV that they're changing and updating every few years. These people are dying for something they know is the Word of God. It's a good question, isn't it? It's a good point. I know a lot of people that know that they know that they know that that book is the Word of God. They die for it. They die for it. But some of these people I meet on the street, they don't know where the Word of God is. You think they're going to die for something that they think man wrote? No. Where is this mass movement today of people that believe in the Word of God? Where is it? It's not the NIV, not the NAS, not the Greek originals. It's the King James Bible. I said 20 years ago, as I stood before the church and people felt awful strange being King James only. People were called a cult for being King James only. And I stood before the church and I just said, on the basis of this verse, Revelation 20, God's going to... God's going to open up this King James movement like never before. That's before I ever even heard of a web. I didn't know what the Internet was. It was years later that Brother James Newman came and told us about this thing called the Internet. That James is awful strange, I tell you. Hey, listen. 
It wasn't long after that that Gail Ripplinger wrote her book, New Age Bible Versions. I was able to hold that thing before the church, and that book exploded all over Christian circles. And uh, I took that as the beginning of the fulfillment of people knowing where the Word of God is. They're getting revived. Amen? They're waking up! I didn't mean to offend you, Brother James. Don't leave. Number 10. I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God because the Bible and Christian history teaches against the doctrine that only the originals are inspired. People say, well, I believe only the originals are inspired. Well, where do you get that from? Do you have a Bible on earth that teaches that? Did you make that? If you don't have a Bible on earth that teaches it, then you made it up. Where did you get that doctrine from? Well, I show in my book that it came from the Jesuits, and I document it plainly. But nevertheless, where, is, where can you prove this in the Bible? Only the originals are inspired. See, that's what you need to ask. They say, well, the, that's just a translation. That can't be perfect. So where did you get that doctrine from? Show me a Bible verse that proves that doctrine. I'll show you a Bible verse that proves the opposite. 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. He said, All Scripture. And then he tells Timothy that you have known from a child the Holy Scriptures. Did Timothy have the originals? Was Timothy holding the original manuscripts? No. So Paul called... The originals, uh, Paul called a copy of the originals Scripture. Do you know that the early church fathers believed that God had miraculously translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek? Every single one of them. Augustine, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, every single one of them believed that God had translated the Bible into the international language of those days, which was Greek. So, Christian history even... So, th this is my point. They say only the originals are inspired. And I say, show me that in the Bible. Because the Bible teaches the opposite. It teaches that copies can be inspired. And then number two, that's not even good Christian history. Where did this doctrine that only originals can be inspired? The early church fathers didn't believe that. So where did you get it from? They say, well, I don't know. I got it from seminary. I know. Well, let me show you where you got it from. You got it from a Jesuit. And I prove it in my book. He was the first one to teach that only the originals are inspired. You know why they did it? Because they said, if we can convince everybody that only the originals are inspired, they will no longer have a Bible that they can trust. And you know who they'll have to trust now? The Catholic Church. So the whole doctrine of only the originals are inspired was so people will look at the Catholic Church as their final authority. And you know what's happening today? People are fleeing what they call the Protestant movement back to Rome. And if you ask them, why are you doing that? They'll say, because I need security. I need authority. I need somebody to tell me what to believe. So, well, why don't you read the Bible? They say there is no perfect Bible. People put brackets all over it and say, this is not in the original manuscript, or this is not in the best manuscript, and, and, and nobody knows. And every time I go to church, the preacher, I'm trying to read my Bible and try to hear, and he says, well, of course, that word there should have been translated so and so. Well, preacher, are you telling me you're up here preaching, and you've given the church a bunch of Bibles, and they're all messed up? If you know how to fix it, why didn't you fix it a long time ago and give the whole church a Bible? People that go to these churches ought to sit here and they ought to listen to the preacher for three years and say, Preacher, I heard you preach through the whole Bible. And I went through and everywhere you corrected it, I fixed it. And so here, I went to the printer and I printed it. Here's your Bible. Here's your perfect... Now, can we quit all this the Greek says mess? Number 11. 
I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God because it's reasonable that God would revive the Bible into the international language of these last days. And the international language is English. I prove it over and over and over again. All around the world they speak English. English. They conduct their business in English. They teach their people. All these other countries teach their people English as a first or second language. So why wouldn't God put the Bible in English? And you know what they tell me? They tell me, well, the Bible is in English, but it's only about 97% perfect. And that 3% allows them to keep changing it and selling new Bibles. And so what I say to that is, okay, you're telling me God's able to get it 97% perfect? Why not 33% perfect? Why 97? I mean, that's a pretty much a high degree of perfection. Why can't He go ahead and do the other 3%? They say, well, man messes it up. Well, why don't you use that argument to begin with, with the original? So, so basically, you've got a God who fell asleep, and He can no longer preserve a perfect Bible. Does that make sense to you? You say, well, you just, it takes a lot of faith to believe that. No, you know what? It doesn't take a lot of blind faith for me to believe that God, who wrote a perfect Bible, would make sure that I have a perfect one in the last days. When Greek is no longer an international language, but English is. That sounds reasonable to me. Knowing my God, knowing what the King James Bible says about God, it's very reasonable that God would have put the Bible in English. The first day I ever realized that is I was in my little library, in my little apartment that I had here in Mansfield, by the way, years ago. And I was reading the back of a Ryrie study Bible. And he said the Bible is perfect, absolutely infallible in the original languages. I'd never heard of a Ruckman. Ripplinger hadn't written a book yet. I, never, I didn't even know what a fundamental Baptist was if it hit, hit me upside the head. i tell you the truth. I didn't know the difference between an independent Baptist and a Southern Baptist. I didn't know any of that. But I looked at that and I said, that's insane. And I threw that thing down and said, he doesn't believe we have a Bible. I'll go to Josh McDowell, you know. He, he, he knows everything. So I pick up my Josh McDowell book and... I mean, this is supposed to be the book that proves Christianity to the world. So I start reading that thing and it says, the Bible is so perfect, absolutely great, it's wonderful, oh, it's just lovely, in the original languages. I threw that thing down. Then I started getting a little desperate. And I went through every single book on my shelf. None of them believe we have a perfect Bible today. And I promise you, as sure as I'm sitting right here, I took my King James Bible that my grandma gave me, and I said, as far as I'm concerned, that's the Bible. Amen. I know that's the Bible. I can hear God speak through that thing. I know this is the Bible. And I became King James only. Another brother told me, I have a cassette tape of an old fellow that teaches the exact same thing you just told me. And we put that tape in. It was Peter Ruckman. And he sat there and was just exposing this lie that only the originals are perfect, you know. And we don't agree with everything Ruckman says. But back then, it was very refreshing to hear that somebody actually understood that. And you know what? If you'll, if you'll go with what God shows you, He'll encourage you. Amen? He'll encourage you. Hey, let me show, show you something else. Number 12. Do you know why I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God? Because it supernaturally avoids pagan words. You say, what do you mean? Do you know the word disaster means a bad thing that happens because of a star? It's an, it's an astrological word. Do you believe in astrology? Do you believe bad things happen because of the stars? That's what that word means. Disaster. Do you know new versions have disaster throughout the whole book? But your King James Bible, even though the word was popular at the time, never one time from Genesis to Revelation uses that word. You know why? 
It's an astrology word. Would God use an astrology word? Would God say bad things happen because of the stars? You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 8, 8, All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. Nothing. Not one. I'm writing a book on this subject, but I'll just give you a few more. You know what the word panic means? It comes from the god Pan. And a panic attack means that you are raped by the god Pan out in the woods. Panic. Do you know the new versions use panic all the way through? But even though the word was popular at the time, do you know your King James Bible never uses it one time? Why is that? Because all of its words are pure. Do you know the Bible talks about wicked people charming, but it never uses the word charm? Like it never says, isn't God, isn't the Word of God charming? But new versions do. New versions use the word charm, which comes from occultism and divination. They use it to describe God. They use it to describe Christianity. I could be here all day showing you, well, not necessarily all day, but I have a lot more of these. How did the King James Bible avoid these words? Because God was behind the book. Number 13, I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God because of how wise the simplest of men and women can become when they read it. Great men down through the ages have said the King James Bible is an education. Whatever you do in homeschool, drench your family in the King James Bible. Let them read it. Let them study it. Let them write it. Let them memorize it. If you're not using the King James Bible as part of your homeschool curriculum, you're not teaching. You've missed it. You've missed it. There's something about that book that a man can read it and and learn how to think. It trains him how to think. Number 14. I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God because whatever reasons may be cited for believing the Christian Bible in general is inspired above the writings of other religions are the same reasons that prove the KJV is inspired. So if somebody ever objects to you and they say, Come on now, why do you believe this King James Bible is infallible and inspired? Well, you can answer. But before you answer, turn it back on them. Say, hold on a second. Do you believe the Hindu Vedas are inspired? They say, oh, no. Do you believe the writings of Nostradamus are inspired? Say, oh, no. Do you believe the Christian Bible is inspired? And just wink for a second. You know, put a hand behind your back. You know they don't really believe there's a perfect Bible today. But they're going to say they believe the Bible, whatever that is, that generic thing called the Bible. They're going to say they believe it's inspired. And what you need to say to them is simply this. I got a sheet of paper now, and here's a white sheet, and here's a pen. Give me your reasons why the Christian Bible is true and the Hindu Vedas are not. And they'll probably just sit there and look at you. They said, wait a second, you're trying to get me to prove why the King James Bible is perfect and, and you can't even answer why you believe in Christianity to begin with? And then they say, well, it's just faith, blind faith. You wanted me to prove why the King James Bible is the Word of God and you don't even know why you believe in Jesus? Now, a scholar, he might make an attempt to give you some reasons. And he'll say, well... Christianity has brought forth fruit in my life. I say, okay, I'll write that down. So is the King James Bible in my life. You'll say, well, it's supernaturally consistent. And you don't see that in the, the writings of other religions. I say, well, so is my King James Bible. So whatever reasons he gives you for believing in God 
and believing in the Christian Bible over the writings of other religions are the same exact reasons why. So once, if he gives you eight of them, say, that's great. Now, I'll give you back to thee. That's why I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God over the NIV or any other book on the face of the earth. See, simple as that. Simple as that. What you'll find is they don't even know what they believe or why. So they want you to believe. Or they want you to list your beliefs. They don't even know what they believe. I did that to one of those uh, uh, UTA teachers one day that was mocking the Christians and making fun of what they believe. And I just sat down before him. I didn't even go to UTA. He thought I did. And so I just sat, had a meeting with him. So I sat down with him. And I said, well, it's nice to mock Christianity, but I can't wait to be so amazed at you telling me how life came from a rock. So I'm going to sit back here and I'm going to be impressed by your great wisdom because you're mocking Christianity. Let's hear your great worldview. How did life come from a rock, buddy? Then you watch him kind of smirk and say, well, you know what? I, I like Christianity. and Yeah, I figured. Uh-huh. See, it's easy to sit here and knock things. It's harder to prove what you believe. So understand that when you deal with people that object to what you believe, go ahead, get under the gun. Go ahead and say, okay, I'll do it. That's fine. I, I don't mind being challenged. Now, I'm going to give you these reasons, and I appreciate you getting me... Uh, uh, putting me on the spot to make me present what I believe and articulate it. But now that we're done, it's your turn. Give me the reasons why it's true. How did life come from a rock? Why did God just make it to where there is no book on the face of the earth anymore that's preserved? Make them speak, folks. Make them speak. And finally, number 15. I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God because there's no other choice. There's no other choice. All the other views are foolish, absurd, and insane. And I'm not going to sit back and play Christianity. And you know what? These scholars that oppose the King James Bible, you know what they say? They say, that's dangerous what you're doing. I know people want certainty, and I know you want to give it to them. But what if that foundation is ever proven to be wrong? Number one, you're never going to prove it. You've been trying for 400 years. You've never done it yet. You're never going to do it. But let's just say you did. <laughs> the people would be right where you have them anyway. You already have them with no foundation. You already have them with saying there's no Word of God on the face of the earth. So what do I have to lose? I'd much rather believe that this perfect, fruitful book that all the enemies of God hate that's brought forth so much fruit in my life that has such supernatural consistency and all the other things I've listed and much more I haven't had time to share with you. I'd much rather believe that's the Word of God than to sit here and try to raise up children and teach a church that, hey folks, we're going to get here and we're supposed to die for Christianity, but guess what? Nobody really knows where the Word of God is. Maybe they'll dig up another manuscript tomorrow and we'll know a little better. But, you know, forget it! That's ridiculous! What could be wrong? Where will I go wrong teaching my children a book that honors the Trinity, honors the blood of Jesus, teaches them how to reason, teaches them how to think, teaches them pure and holy doctrine? Where will I go wrong? Now, I fully believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. I'm just putting an arm behind my back and pretending, what if? See, I have nothing to lose. Either I believe your crazy idea that only the originals are inspired and there's no perfect Bible in the face of the earth. And you need to realize that the people in the pews don't realize what the preachers of the churches are teaching. They don't. When, when the preacher gets up and says, this church believes the Word of God... And grandma sits over there and says, oh, I just love this church. They believe the Word of God. If grandma ever walked up to the preacher and said, preacher, is this Bible perfect from Genesis to Revelation in every word? He'd say, well, no, no, only the original is perfect. We don't have an inspired Bible today. Well, preacher, you lied on Sunday. 
Because you held up that book and said that this was the perfect Word of God. And you don't believe there's a perfect Bible anywhere on the face of the earth. Are you just lying to us? And you say, well, there's things we believe that we don't want to get out, you know. We don't want the people to know. Well, you're not hiding it too much because you get up and correct a thing every five minutes. Should we believe that the only Word is in heaven? Is that going to help you stand against the cults? Is that going to help you in your warfare? See, let me show you how this thing works real quick as we close. There's only one book on the face of the earth that teaches against cross-dressing. That's the King James Bible. Because the word effeminate has been taken out of all the new versions in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So here's the devil tempting this age with a so-called unisex, feminist, androgyny agenda where men and women become blurred in their distinctions, which the Gnostic ancient manuscripts warned would happen before the kingdom of Antichrist. You're faced with that temptation. How are you going to stand against it? Well, you can quote 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Those that are effeminate shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, now you've stood against it. How are you going to stand against it in new versions? There's lots of doctrines that the new versions don't teach. That's why holiness is such a mess today. Because not only do people not know, they have doubt what the Word of God is, but doctrine, entire doctrines are removed out of these new versions. How can you stand against the devil? How can you have a sword to resist the devil if you don't even know if it's the Word of God? And I'll just give you two more for extra credit. Well, I just know that I know that I know. This is subjective reason. But it's extra credit. I'm just throwing it out there. There's something about that book. I had a bunch of hippies over one time in the early days. and Back when I was having a Bible study in my house, you know. And one of them picked up one of those new versions. And Boy, they just started reading. They said, what is this? And they threw it. They just knew that wasn't the Word of God. I said, I'm sorry, man, I was doing some studies. Let me give you a real Bible. You just know that you 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 know there's something about that book. It's subjective. But there's something there, amen? And I've already said the final one. What harm will come? What harm will come? What harm will come? I raise holy, wise, smart children. What are you going to give me from believing in an ancient Greek that's no longer here? What, what holiness? What doctrine that I'm not going to understand? What are you going to give me that I don't see from that book? Nothing. 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 So, Sister Lynn, would you please come sing today? Let's get the Word of God in our church. Amen? Let's get the Word of God in our homes. Let's get in fellowship. Let's wash our wives and children and our own hearts in the Word of God. Let's get more of it. Let's read it, memorize it, pray it, and love it. Let's obey Deuteronomy chapter 6. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and you shall teach them your children. Are you teaching the Word of God to your children? Speaking of them when thou sittest in thy house. What are you speaking of when you sit in your house? Or maybe you're not even speaking. Maybe you're sitting back with your mouth wide open as the TV is speaking to you. And when thou walkest by the way... Let's get out and walk with our families. When thou liest down and when thou risest up, and thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thy house and upon thy gates, what type of images are in your house that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children? You want your days multiplied? I do. I do. I want them multiplied in fruitfulness. That's what I want. All right, I tell you what, the Lord's spoken to you today. If you want to dedicate yourself to the Word of God, if you want to get excited about the Word of God today, if the Lord's moving upon you to get the Word of God in your house, let's come forward and have an altar call, a time of prayer, a time of dedication to the Word of God as our dear sister sings.
My faith looks up to thee. Thank you, Lord. Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Yes, amen. That's good. Thank you, God, for salvation by grace through faith alone, by the blood. Bless our lunch together, and we thank you for this morning's service. Lord, let us fill our families with your word. In Jesus' name, amen.